Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Ellison, and I am running for the United States House of Representatives to represent Florida's 17th Congressional District. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining our town hall discussion uh, centered around agriculture. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone is safe during this COVID time. Uh, we've had many other uh, town hall meetings, but for the sake of uh, bringing and shedding light on the agricultural uh, issues, I brought on some guests uh, who's going to be talking about this issue with you all. Uh, my first guest is uh, Mr. Anthony Eichberger. Uh, he is the founder of the Regis Initiative, uh, which is a public awareness campaign designed to promote sustainable, diverse crop production. Uh, my other guest is Trevor Murphy. He currently serves as a, the Chief Operating Officer of Murphy Ag Solutions of Heartland. Uh, Con Citrus Management, Phoenix Groves, and KM, KM Groves. Uh, Murphy also currently serves on the Board of Directors of the Highlands County Farm Bureau, the Board of Directors of the Highlands County Citrus Growers Association, and the Leadership Highlands Advisory Board and United Way of Central Florida Highlands County Advisory Board. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. For having us. Thank you for having us, yes. So uh, the question always comes up in campaigns uh, about the agricultural industry, um, particularly here in Florida, since we're the state's uh, number two producer of uh, agriculture in the country. And so my question uh, for you, uh, uh, Mr. Murphy, is you know, what inspired you? What got you involved in the agricultural industry? Well, like many things, uh, I, I grew up in the industry. Um, my grandfather started in, in the uh, industry back in the 50s uh, in the fertilizer and citrus business. Uh, my grand or my uncles and my father fought along in it. Um, I grew up, learned to drive in, in an orange grove uh, probably before I was 15, might have hit a few trees, um, but my driving is a lot better now. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, it's hard work, but it's very rewarding, you know, being able to put food on people's tables and seeing the change throughout the, the season. And it's it's always changing. Um, so it keeps you on your toes. No, oh, that's right. Mr. Eichberger, what inspired you? Well, it was kind of interesting how I first, I don't come from a farming background myself. When I first got interested in agri-sustainability, it actually predated the 2016 election. I got into kind of a argument with a friend of a friend on Facebook who she was basically taking a Darwinian attitude toward our food systems and keep in mind this particular person was someone who called herself a progressive so it seemed mind-boggling to me that she was willing to you know take that rather um, that rather survivalist mentality rather than looking at how what can we do in terms of agriculture to make it beneficial for everyone across the country so that's why I that was an impetus for why I founded this public awareness campaign. And we've been, uh, we've been going since uh, summer of 2018. And our goal is basically to let people know how agri-sustainability benefits uh, Americans as a whole and how it spills into different other topic areas that get more attention than agriculture tends to get uh, in terms of the public discourse. Absolutely, I appreciate that. You know, um, Oftentimes, we hear those terms, agricultural sustainability. Can you elaborate on that for our viewers so that they can have a better understanding of what that is, what that means? Yeah, I mean, agri-sustainability, different people have different definitions to it. The way I define it is, what are we doing to make sure that our food systems are going to be durable and long-lasting? So one element that doesn't get talked about quite enough is the crop production aspect. Uh, by no means, are we advocating that crop production be entirely indoors? At the same time, there's a lot of agri-tech and new innovations, whether it's hydroponics, uh, aeroponics, aquaponics, uh, vertical farming, that can be done indoors to shield crop production from the elements. So if we begin relying more, more on those forms of agriculture while still preserving and improving the traditional outdoor field agriculture, we'll be in a lot better shape in terms of having multiple food sources to draw from. And so that's, in a nutshell, how I view agri-sustainability. Maybe others would have different definitions for it. Okay, thank you so much for that. 
a lot of you may not know, but I'm also a cosmetologist and I had uh, the opportunity of meeting Trevor uh, at my salon. Uh, I gave him a nice haircut, but that was before COVID. Uh, so so he's, he's due for a haircut now. Um, <laughs> but when he was in the shop, we had a conversation about a trip that I took over to Africa. And um, we had a, a situation there where there was uh, farmers who were literally fighting with uh, uh, herders, uh, cow herders. And the reason they were fighting is because uh, the, the farmers were trying to grow uh, crops for human consumption, but the farmers or the herders were having uh, to try to find food for the cows. And oftentimes the cows would just eat off of the land that was designed uh, for human consumption. And they would, they would fight and they would fight to the death. And this has been going on for some years now. And so uh, one of the proposals that I put on the, on the table um, was to come up with a way to feed uh, the cows so they don't have to encroach upon the land. I think since 2016, almost 5,000 people have died in those type of exchanges. Uh, and so food insecurity is a, is a huge uh, subject matter, not only in Africa, but throughout the world. And so, you know, these are the kind of conversations that uh, Trevor and I were having. And I wanted to kind of bring these uh, levels of conversations to the forefront so that people can uh, have a, 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 a wide ranging uh, knowledge base of the issues. So we're talking about uh, sustainable agriculture. We're talking about uh, uh, mechanized farming. We're going to be talking about climate change as it as it relates to how you know food crops are produced. And uh, you know, based on that, you know, I want Trevor to speak to some of the challenges uh, that he's faced in the uh, agricultural industry uh, as it relates to citrus greening, uh, maybe just you know uh, crop rotation problems. Uh, any other bacteria that is taking place inside of uh, Florida? So, uh, Trevor, can you speak to that? Yes, sir. So uh, we've we've faced a uh, uphill battle over the past 15 years or so uh, with a disease called citrus greening. Um, it's a bacteria that infects the the trees and uh, ultimately uh, causes a, an early death uh, for the tree. Um, 15 years ago, we could have trees that were 100 years old. Um, producing oranges, and those are all but, but gone now. Um, there was a, uh, a little insect that you, know, you can see with your eye um, that is the only insect in the world that transmit the disease. Um, initially, they think came from China in the early 1900s um, and was found in Miami-Dade uh, County back in 2005, um, which in agriculture, um, that port of Miami-Dade is, is very important because that's where a lot of um, fruits and vegetables come in. And it's a uh, starting point for anything that is not natural uh, to the state to come into the state. Um, to put in perspective, in 2005, we we're producing roughly 250 million boxes of uh, oranges. This year, we're roughly 70 million boxes um, at the end of the year. So production has gone down. Um, another thing that we deal with roughly every 10 years or so is hurricanes. Um, 2017, we lost uh, 50 to 60% of our crop. Um, we had to wait roughly two years um, for assistance uh, from the government. Um, it's something in the citrus industry we've always been proud of is not relying um, on, I, I guess, help from the government um, in the form of subsidies. Um, we've always kind of taken care of ourselves, but after the hurricane, the crop insurance uh, in place um, did not make us whole or, or keep us farming. Um, and then on top of that, you're looking at imports. Um, after the hurricanes, uh, processors brought in um, a lot of juice from Mexico and Brazil, um, thinking that we would not rebound, um, which Florida Citrus, we always find a, re uh, a way to rebound. And with that, the prices are suppressed um, this past year. Um, the price levels were roughly half of what uh, uh, the break-even cost is to, to grow. Um, and we're not the only industry. Um, the dairy industry has been facing a lot of the same challenges. Um, beef uh, industry as well right now. Um, we're kind of at the mercy 
um, us and beef, um, the beef industry has four uh, processors throughout the whole country. Um, same thing goes pretty much for processors and, and citrus. And um, we're, we're at their mercy on, on things. So it's, it's always a, a challenge, but we always try to find new innovative uh, solutions to get through it. What are, the, what are some of the innovative solutions, uh, Anthony, uh, have you found uh, to kind of combat some of this, uh, these problems that exist? Well, as, as I alluded to earlier, um, hydroponics and aeroponics, for those who don't know, a very quick uh, lay explanation. Um, it's where you can grow crops indoors, sometimes outdoors, but normally indoors without having to rely on soil. So they use a, um, a water nutri a nutrient solution and aeroponics is different from hydroponics in that they use a mist spray over it rather than the plants, the crops growing in the solution. Um, vertical farming can utilize hydroponic or aeroponic technology. Vertical farming is more so where uh, you grow indoors on um, multiple level. So uh, just picture greenhouses stacked on top of each other in a facility that has the infrastructure to house that. Uh, not only does it save a lot of space, but as I, again, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to rely on, you don't have to be at the mercy of destructive weather in terms of whether your crops are harvested. One of the reasons why more people don't do this is because it's, it's incredibly uh, cost prohibitive right now. Uh, if for either startup farmers or even existing farmers, they just don't have the capital to invest in that infrastructure. So that's where there is a role, I think, for the government to step in and whether it's micro loans, whether it's direct grants, um, to make more of this infrastructure, uh, not just more widespread, but also uh, investing in the R&D to make it more reliable and to have quality control when you're growing these crops. Because understandably, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of questionable opinion, uh, people have questionable outlooks on whether or not growing these types of crops indoors has the same sort of taste, the same sort of flavor, uh, same sort of overall quality that it does when you use traditional fields. So I think one way that we can guarantee that that quality is delivered is by investing in a lot more food research, uh, agri-science labs. Uh, a lot of those types of solutions are really going to go a long way toward uh, diversifying our food systems and how we deliver and how we even grow. Because people talk a lot about delivery and uh, fair trade policies and uh, fair wages for farmers. And all of that is extremely important. But oftentimes, people never talk about, the, they forget the production aspect. They just assume that we're going to be able to continue farming the way we have, and we don't know what Mother Nature has in store for us in the coming decades. So uh, I'd say it's better to be safe than sorry, and the worst case scenario will be we have more diversified food sources to draw from. Uh, and the best, the best case scenario is we're actually pe uh, preparing for a scenario in the future where if there's another major pandemic, uh, you know, how is that going to... Uh, what impact will that have on the uh, food chain supply? And, you know, this is, I think this is our hedging our bets in terms of an uncertain future as we move forward in the, over the course of this decade. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Murphy. Uh, how has COVID-19 uh, impacted the agricultural industry uh, inside of Highlands County? So there's a, uh, a hashtag trend going on, uh, still farming. Um, which we, we don't stop, um, you know, and, and citrus, we're still harvesting. Uh, we just finished our harvest personally about a week ago. Um, there's concerns, um, and different steps that we implemented, you know, for, uh, for our employees to, to be safe. We rely a lot on H2A labor, uh, that we bring in for Mexico every year. Um, and if the labor, um, uh, situation dries up, uh, if one of them got infected, um, the, the crops, uh, citrus is not as perishable as, as some of the leafy greens or, or other vegetables. Um, and the, the window is about a six to seven month window. Um, but it's definitely important. So in other areas of, of agriculture, that's, that's been a very, um, a, a rough, uh, side of things on dairy. Um, they milk the cows twice, twice a day. Um, the cows have to be milked and with, uh, restaurants, um, being shut down with uh, uh, the tourism uh, market, uh, cruise ships being down. Um, it's affected us on OJ as well. A lot of those guys, they, they use front concentrate and that 
uh, market has pretty much uh, been in a free fall because nobody's been able to, to go out. Um, thankfully, people still rely and it's in the back of their, their heads that uh, for some reason, uh, Florida orange juice, uh, you know, the vitamin C it provides, you know, there, there are health benefits and that's something us at the industry is trying to educate and put in the forefront of people's minds because prior to the COVID, uh, the past 10 years, uh, we've been seeing a decline of roughly four to 5% a year in consumption. Um, so those trends have changed um, for, for the good um, because people are trying to, to uh, stay on top and stay in, you know, with their immune systems on things. Um, so that's kind of the biggest thing, but it's pretty much business as usual um, as far as the day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, I, um, I had a conversation with another farmer um, a few months back and there was some conversations about uh, maybe trying a different type of um, fruit or a different type of produce uh, in, the, in the 17th district. Uh, some have actually gone as far as to go to Italy to learn about um, growing grapes. Is that something that you've considered as well or, or you're going to stick to what you know? Well, there's, uh, there's a lot of different things that we're trying in, in the district. Um, one's grapes. Another thing um, is bamboo. Um, that There's a number of guys. Um, actually, in Hardy County, there's a, a new uh, company called Hardy Fresh um, that is doing the vertical farming uh, aquaponics uh, inside on leafy greens. Um, so it's, it's always a risk. Um, to do, we we experiment, we farm some in the past, we've done peppers and, and squash, um, but at this moment, uh, we're, we're focusing on, on what we know and, and that citrus. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are, are getting very used to seeing me in the suit, but what they don't know is I grew up uh, working in the orange groves and, and working on farms as well, so I used to get my hands dirty. Uh, a couple of times I've seen some rat snakes jump out of the tree <laughs> and that's a sight you got to reach for orange if you're not getting stuck by a thorn <laughs> you got to contend with the rat snakes so uh you know that that's some grueling uh work you know to be able to climb those ladders and and put oranges in the sack you know and sometimes those sacks will break your back yes sir. So I, I have a, a great deal of respect for uh farmers ranchers and, and people who are out there trying to make it happen to put food on the table every day. Uh, last year, I was in Africa and I had a chance to uh, try my hand at some uh, hydroponics. And um, as I was saying earlier, the reason I did that is because I wanted to make sure that the herders had access to uh, fodder, which is a type a, which is a type of uh, food source for uh, livestock. And so we were able to grow seven inches of fodder in six days uh, to be able to feed those cows. And so, uh, you know, I've gone to different seminars and symposiums and found that just by changing the food source, we can actually make an impact on carbon, on the carbon footprint based on the methane that uh, cattle let off, you know, around the world. So if we were to change the, the uh, food source or feed uh, for these cows around the world, uh, we would be doing a lot, not only to give them more nutrient rich uh, food sources, but also to uh, curb the carbon footprint uh, throughout the world by at least three to four percent. So, you know, that was pretty interesting to learn that, pretty interesting uh, to engage in that. And just wanted to know, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Anthony, I know you said that you were dealing with some hydroponics, but what I wanted to know is, have you thought about doing aquaponics? Well, aquaponics is great because uh, I'm sure, as you know, you're, for the uh, for the sake of your viewers who aren't familiar with the term, uh, aquaponics is you typically you're raising fish in tanks or other types of seafood perhaps, but the water gets re-nitrified back and forth between the greenhouses or the the hydroponic layout where the actual crops, the herbs and the leafy greens are grown. So it's a way of uh, conserving the water and reusing the water, and plus you're you have different food sources in the same facility. So just imagine what could be done if aside from you know, the tilapia and the, um, the trout and salmon that normally gets uh, uh, raised in aquaponic facilities, what if we expanded that to include shrimp, lobster, uh, other aquatic life that quite frankly is at risk of becoming in danger with the way our oceans are being polluted. So, um, and 
on the on the vegetable fruit and vegetable end of it, when you uh, you know it's great all the developments that have been uh, made when it comes to varieties of lettuce, when it comes to beans, cucumbers, uh, sure, you know, tomatoes. But what about the crops that are more difficult to grow hydroponically right now? So citrus being a perfect example, obviously, you know, a tree needs a lot of space and a lot of um, nurture for the for the roots so that the the fruit can grow appropriately. But what if there was there were scientific advancements? And I don't know what time frame. Maybe it might be ten years down the road. Maybe it might be fifty years down the road. But what if at some point we could grow citrus hydroponically? And I mean, the science isn't where it needs to be in terms of that being something that can be easily done, but if we don't invest in it, then it never will become a reality. So we should do, you know, we should focus on the crops that have been working hydroponically and also see what can be done to, uh, to escalate the crop diversity. But yeah, I'm a big supporter of aquaponics. So I totally, I'm in total agreement with you there, Alan. You know, uh, Trevor, that's something I would like to try with you. Can we do that? <laughs> we can give it a run. <laughs> okay, I'm looking forward to it. You know, um, the question uh, that I wanted to ask you guys, uh, because I'm running for the United States Congress, and I don't uh, claim to know everything there is about uh, agriculture, but I do believe in representing the people, and I do believe in representing the interests of the people. So what I wanted to know is, what would you like to see from somebody like me in Congress uh, or from other elected officials on the subject matter. Trevor, can you go first? Well, uh, having a, a voice for the farmer is, is important. You know, up there in, in D.C., a lot of things get lost. Um, uh, Representative uh, Rooney that was there uh, prior, he was a, a voice and champion um, for us, um, especially back in 17 whenever uh, Irma came through and pushing through and, and uh, fighting, you know, for your constituents um, is very important. Um, things that we're facing, you know, at, at this time, um, I, I think going back again with the sustainability that Anthony was talking about um, with another pandemic, um, you know, you, you see what happened on the PPE, PPE um, issues that we're having, you know, we've subbed out a lot of it, we've exported it. Um, and it's similar to uh, food sources, you know, coming in, um, making sure that, you know, the, the Florida, Florida and the U.S. Uh, farming industry um, is on the forefront of, of things because we can't have, um, have to rely on, on other countries for our, our food sources in an event that, uh, some, that something happens. And a lot of that, you know, comes in a trade policy um, just a couple uh, weeks ago. Um, the USDA um, announced that they were allowing imports uh, from China on uh, citrus and coming into California. So it's on the opposite side of uh, the country. Um, but again, I look back to 2005 um, with citrus greening and it came probably from China, came into our, our ports and the phytosanitary, you know, issues are, are the big thing, I think. Um, that we look at and, you know, the, the EPA, you know, we've got rules and regulations that we have to follow. You know, we've got BMPs, which is best management practices um, that we implement. Um, we, you know, take a look at uh, water quality um, and quantity that, that we pump out. Um, so having a, a good, you know, uh, relationship um, with your constituents and, um, you know, being on top of the, the uh, top of the ball, I think, is important. Thank you. Anthony? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that need to be done in, in the next two or three years, let alone the, the entire decade ahead of us. Um, I think the, the best thing to point at would be the, in the 2018 Farm Bill that was passed. Um, that doesn't get a lot of discussion because, again, it's not considered a, a sexy or trendy political topic, but uh, largely due to the efforts of U.S. Senator De Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. Um, she was instrumental in making sure that there was an Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production set up as part of the last Farm Bill. They just recently allocated the money, uh, I believe it was about $3 million, and they've now the grant process is um, online for farmers who want to uh, see if they can, uh, you know, further their, uh, their operations and their endeavors using that office. 
Uh, $3 million, though, even though it sounds like a lot, is just a drop in the bucket compared to what we need. Um, so I think definitely boosting the funding for the Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. I know that's a big mouthful. Um, and, but also, the next farm bill is coming up, coming up in 2023. So that seems like a long way away, but it really isn't. There are, just, there are two election cycles between now, one general and one midterm. And we don't know what the composition of Congress will look like, but we should begin. I think if citizens are demanding what they want in the next farm bill, um, you know, the lawmakers would be, it would behoove them to listen when we get to that point, when we have to, you know, renew the farm bill in 2023. So more R&D, you know, more funding for agri-tech. And perhaps, I don't want to say most important, but equally as important as, as all of these things that I've mentioned is the next USDA secretary. The next US Secretary of Agriculture cannot be someone who is in the pocket of big agriculture. Meaning if it's someone who is a former lobbyist or uh, a former, or has some sort of uh, financial paper trail to any of the big corporate agriculture, agribusinesses, you know, that's a serious conflict of interest. Now, the next edition of the Regis newsletter that we're putting out in, in the summer, we have a short list of about 32 different potential candidates for Secretary of Agriculture. So hopefully that's something that, you know, it's not, most other cabinet positions get more airtime. People are concerned about, you know, who's going to be the next Attorney General, who will be the next Defense Secretary, Treasury Secretary, State. But no one ever talks about who is going to be the next uh, Secretary of Agriculture. So this is an incredible opportunity to get ahead of the curve there and say, you know, here are some of the types of people who would make great appointments. And, you know, can we begin lobbying for these even before the next administration, um, you know, gets set up? So uh, Secretary of Ag and then um, definitely boosting the funding. Uh, just, I'll just say one other quick uh, reference. And I wrote down the bill number in case any of your viewers want to uh, look it up. There are two pieces of legislation that haven't gone anywhere uh, because of the way the Senate and House and Senate are right now, but the Saving America's Pollinator Act, which is H.R. 1337, and then the Food and Farm Act, uh, which is H.R. 4425, both of which were sponsored by uh, Earl Blumenauer, congressman from uh, Oregon. Um, if we see not even a standalone bills, but if we see components of those folded into the next uh, farm bill in 2023, I think, um, you know, we'll, we have a, we have an, a phenomenal um, groundwork laid in that scenario to have uh, a really agri-sustainable path for these next several decades ahead of us. So those are some of the things that I'd like to see in the next Congress and next administration. Um, and I hope people will, I hope we'll see more discussion on those. I think so. Trevor, do you have anything that you want to add to the um, what you want to see in the new farm bill? Yeah, um, piggybacking on the, the farm bill, I, I think it gets lost in everything else that gets thrown into the, uh, uh, the actual farm bill. Um, whenever you talk about um, the day-to-day the -day operations, the policies and everything else that Anthony was talking about, that's just a very, very small part um, whenever you take into uh, um, the, the food um, side of, of the actual farm bill. Um, so taking a look at trying to separate uh, those two, and making sure that uh, funding is available for some of these farmers and some of these programs. Yeah. Which will be an uphill battle. Yeah, we know that, you know, in Florida, farming represents almost 14% of the total labor force. And so we want to do everything that we can to make sure that uh, farmers and farm workers, you know, have access to a, a, a good job. We don't want to lose any of those jobs. Uh, I know a few years ago, uh, Congress sent uh, about $20 million to the University of Florida to study citrus greening. And um, do you have any insight on what their findings were um, from that research that was done on the citrus greening? So research wise, um, it's been something that's been going on, you know, as you said, uh, um, for about 15 years, um, the dollar amount that's been spent is much higher than that, more, more than $20 million. Um, a lot of the findings have been done in the field um, by growers um, just because we can't wait, you know, three to five years and replicate trials and everything else. We've, 
we're desperate. Um, so we've taken it in our own hands um, before. You know, growers didn't always talk and share secrets um, on what was working, but, you know, it's a very small, close-knit community. And for us to survive, that's what we've had to do. Um, recently, they've been able to uh, uh, replicate the, uh, the bacteria in a lab, which is something they have not been able to do in the past 15 years. Um, with that, we're hoping that um, that'll speed up some of the research on uh, finding, you know, the silver bullet. Um, but in the meantime, we're, we're implementing other, um, other practices. And there was recently um, um, a program called CRAFT. Um, that was another program uh, uh, that's being administered by, uh, by FDAX, the Florida Department of Ag. Um, and that's roughly 2,000 acres of different trials, of different growers throughout the whole state. Um, taking a look at what's working on a larger scale, a minimum of 20 acres um, in the field. Um, so I'm hopeful, you know, that that'll give us some, some forward um, thinking ideas and uh, help everybody out. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I was recently at an uh, economic summit um, by Nikki Freed and her team, and they talked a great deal about uh, the hemp industry and how that might uh, boost our, our economy. I didn't realize there were so many different um, products that can come out of hemp. Uh, can you gentlemen speak to uh, what you know about the industry and are, is there any interest uh, in getting involved with that industry at all? I can speak to it. Um, recently, uh, that's kind of been the, the big topic over the past year. Um, last year at the uh, Citrus Expo down in Fort Myers. Uh, there was a um, discussion on it, a whole uh, seminar. Um, the head czar of uh, hemp was down there and really pitching hard. You know, I, I'd love to hire her as a, as a saleswoman because um, she, she did a great job. But at the, the end of the day, you know, as a farmer, you've got to have a, uh, a place for your product. And that's our big concern is uh, processing um, and getting the product, you know, from the field, um, processed and whether it's textiles, um, or, or any of the other, you know, I think there's thousands of, of, uh, different uses, um, of it. Um, you know, that's been our biggest concern and, and also looking at other States, um, that have done it. Um, once you start having a higher THC level, um, you, your only option is to burn the, uh, the field. And the government said that, you know, they, they would step in and give you some kind of compensation for it. Um, but I would rather not have to rely on, on waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, what about you? Well, I mean, hemp and cannabis are two of the, uh, I mean, it's the same thing, essentially. It's one of the easiest things to grow hydroponically or in vertical farms. And in fact, there is a, we have a, um, a local, aquaponic facility called Superior Fresh here in West Central Wisconsin. They used to do tilapia and lettuce as their two main products that they'd use the aquaponic technology for. They recently transitioned out of lettuce and into growing hemp because they found that it would be, there'd be a larger market for it and it would be more profitable. Uh, what I'd like to see is uh, a reality down the road where um, more farmers have the ability to you know, empower themselves with being able to expand the crops that they wish to grow and the, the diversity of those crops. And again, if they have that infrastructure, uh, it's a lot easier to do, but you know, the money has to come from somewhere. So that's where I think the funding is a big issue. But yeah, I think um, with, with hemp, um, one of the key things that a lot of people talk about and no one really, really knows how to harness this is how do you get younger generations involved with politics and in particularly this topic area? Because there are very few states where the average age of farmers is decreasing. I think Maine is one of the only states where the average age of farmers is getting younger. But if we're, we're looking at ways to engage, you know, my generation, uh, millennials, and then centennials, the generation that comes after mine. You know, if you're looking at getting generations Y and Z, millennials and centennials, more active in the, in the process, I mean, for obvious reasons, that's going to sound appealing is, you know, growing more hemp and cannabis, but that you can use that as a gateway to look at the other uh, diversity of fruits, vegetables, and uh, fish and seafood that can be raised through all this new technology and really getting, um, you know, the two youngest generations of adults more actively engaged 
in uh, wanting to be a part of this movement, a part of the uh, agri-sustainability movement. And think of all the jobs that could potentially be created if we found ways to make this infrastructure more efficient, more readily available. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it would be uh, the end all or be all to employment, but I think it would certainly go a long way to opening up a lot more employment opportunities you know, as the um, as more young people enter the workforce. And even when you look at uh, baby boomers and Gen Xers who aren't ready to retire yet, um, this is something that can cross all age groups. But in particular, if you're emphasizing how do you get young people more excited, you already have climate change as one, um, one gateway for that. But climate change and agri-sustainability really go hand in hand as issues. And unfortunately, we don't hear enough about agriculture when climate change activists are you know, talking about uh, the importance of reducing greenhouse gases, reducing pollution, reducing waste. Uh, so I think we need, agriculture needs to be a lot more in the mix. And I think that's where you, that's where you get the young people. That's where you get the millennials and centennials uh, really involved in wanting to be a part of the change and be a part of the uh, transformation. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I remember growing up is uh, taking ag at, in high school um, and I was a part of Future Farmers of America. Uh, but I wanted to know if you gentlemen had any um, ideas or, or any uh, suggestions on programs for the youth uh, with the Farm Bureau or any other uh, program that's out there. Because we want to make sure that our, our, our youth is exposed to as many agricultural programs as possible. Uh, because when we're talking about ag agriculture, we're talking about food security. I mean, those two terms really go uh, hand in hand as well. Uh, so Trevor, do you have any uh, programs that you can let our viewers know about that they can maybe introduce their, their children to? Yeah. So uh, through Farm Bureau, there's a uh, program, <coughs> excuse me, uh, called the Young Farmers and Ranchers. And it's uh, for a group of 18 to 35 year olds. And it's kind of a transition from, uh, from the FFA and the 4-H programs that you find in your youth. Um, with that, you know, uh, Farm Bureau, you know, we're the, the voice of agriculture is, is our motto, um, whether it's lobbying, um, whether it's, you know, keeping all of our members uh, informed on issues. Um, it's a, a great opportunity. Um, the, the Young Farmers and Ranchers, it's a, a mix, you know, of the majority of people, you know, are not in, in uh, actual production agriculture. And it's an opportunity for those individuals to stay abreast of, of the issues. Um, because at the end of the day, if you're eating, um, you've, you've got a, uh, uh interest in, in agriculture. Oh yeah, definitely. Anthony, do you have any? Um, I mean, I think that there are some, uh, there's some real potential for the department of U S department of education to partner with the department of agriculture, uh, most likely in the next administration. Um, when it comes to just the funding, I mean, so many school districts are, very heavily on their own when it comes to funding their curriculums, particularly electives. So, I mean, as, as we all know, most schools don't require agri-science, and I'm not saying it should be a requirement, but I think that um, if more students have the opportunity to take ag science courses as electives, um, you know, that would go a long way toward, you know, fostering this new climate of, you know, uh, cultivating what I call agro-warriors, which is, by the way, a hashtag I, I would encourage everyone to use, hashtag agro-warriors, because all of us, uh, you know, as Kyle's just saying, you know, we all want, uh, we want, we all want a long-lasting food supply where that doesn't get broken, and um, we don't know what's coming down the pipe as far as future natural disasters and such. So I think when, um, definitely in our public schools, but also even private schools, charter schools, parochial schools, there's a role for potentially some funding when it comes to specifically agri-science curriculum. And can we narrowly allocate those resources to, to, toward those particular programs, whether they're in school or even after hours as extracurriculars. So Montessori schools, Waldorf schools, Hillsdale academies, I think everything should be on the table. Um, I, I understand that people don't wanna merge too much when it comes to you know, what are we funding with schools? But I think agricultural curriculums should definitely be an exception to that, where it's a priority uh, in terms of where we put our money. Yeah, I recently went to one of the uh, the ag venture uh, 
programs that they have here in Highlands County with my daughter. And I, I, I enjoyed myself. I, um, I thought that more uh, parents should be, you know, out there with their children uh, because it teaches them a lot about agriculture. It, it, they teach them how to uh, do transplanting and, and they teach them how to milk cows and, and uh, understand our ecology and, and various things that exist in the environment. Um, and it's all, it's all set up to inspire the kids. Uh, my daughter, she brought home some things and we got a chance to plant some, some plants and crops and beans and all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, she was very excited about that as, you know, as was her, um, her, her fellow um, students and things of that nature. So, yeah, I mean, that's what we need to do. We need to, we need to get these uh, children excited about it, get them involved in it because they are our future and food security is important. Uh, I grew up in Hardy County and, you know, agriculture is emperor in Hardy County. And um, I understand very well what it means to the millions of people uh, that are engaged in it, but I also understand what it means to the hundreds of millions of people that benefit from that. And so it's, it's a very important issue to me it's one that I'm definitely looking at uh, increasing funding for, uh, because without food security, you know, we would all perish. And like as I said before, food security is directly tied to agriculture. So uh, we need to continue to have these discussions and raise the awareness around them, uh, not only here in the state but throughout uh, the country. Um, at this time, we're going to take a few questions from the uh, the audience. Some of them have already sent their questions in. And so we have a question from Apani uh, from Highlands County. And the question is, uh, have, how have EPA regulations impacted the agricultural business? And has it impacted Mr. Murphy's business? And how do business insiders feel about EPA guidelines? All right, well, I guess I can uh, start off on that. Um, you know, the EPA is a uh, blessing and a curse. Um, I look back, you know, with us being involved in the fertilizer and chemical industry for 60 plus years, um, I grew up in it. Um, we grew up, um, you know, around the warehouses and, and uh, chemicals that we no longer use anymore, um, that they still use uh, in other parts of the world. Um, so as far as uh, harmful um, toxic, you know, skull and crossbone uh, chemicals, um, they're all but, you know, gone. Um, on the flip side, um, the, the new chemistry, new compounds that, you know, we are able to use do not uh, last as long. Um, so at times, you know, there's more frequent um, applications on things, but the, uh, the half-life, you know, on products um, are a lot um, shorter. Um, as far as um, equipment for our our drivers, um, tractor drivers, everything is um, enclosed, um, at least the tractors that we use, air conditioned. Um, so they do have a buffer, um, whereas, you know, even 20 years ago, um, they were spraying in open cab tractors. Um, so that's, you know, uh, steps that we, we take um, to, to help um, the environment and also our, our workers. Um, and again, you know, on the BMPs, that's something that we do voluntary um, on the best management practices. Um, but sometimes, you know, there is overstep, I would say. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. Um, a lot of stuff usually starts in California and works its way this way. So if we're ever looking for issues, we just look out west. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard about, you know, Roundup, which is glyphosate, the active ingredients, um, chlorpyrifos is another, um, insecticide that is, uh, kind of hot, uh, hot topic right now. Um, but it's, as long as things are, are used properly, um, and you've got the right, uh, protection in place, you know, I, I think the EPA is, is doing a, a good job. Anthony, uh, what's your take on the EPA as it relates to agriculture and the environment? Well, I mean, obviously we need regulation when it comes to safety issues, but I do agree that uh, perhaps there can be over-regulation and there shouldn't be necessarily a one-size-fits-all um, you know, regu regulatory framework if we're looking with uh, you know, different climates in different parts of the country, uh, even different types of farmings too. Maybe the EPA would need to look at having separate standards for 
field agriculture versus indoor agriculture. Just because indoor agriculture, you can control the conditions a lot better than you can when you're farming outdoors. So, I mean, that doesn't mean one is superior than the other. I think it means we need both. Um, I think one of the big misconceptions that people have when they hear about, you know, regulating um, environmental regulations is that, you know, any form of sustainable agriculture would somehow be a government takeover of the agricultural industry. And I think that's the furthest thing from the truth. Um, in fact, I would flip it around. When people talk about they want um, smaller government, they want um, you know less federal government intervention, uh, they want a free market with a lot of competition. I think that the government, ironically enough, the government stepping into resources for farmers of all different types, all different regions, and allowing people to have allowing farmers to grow a wider variety of crops. I think that would lend itself 100% to free market competition. So if, pe if people who say they're in favor of free market competition, they should really look at a lot of the giveaways and handouts that are being given to the big agribusiness giants. And, um, you know, again, I agree uh, with those who are uh, hesitant about over-regulating, but I think we need to regulate to the extent to which, you know, we're going to be ensuring food safety and uh, making sure that the, the crops continue to flourish and can even improve upon that. Um, I'm not the best person to ask when it comes to the technical aspects of the different regulations. I'll defer to others uh, in that respect. Okay. Uh, well, I wonder if, if you gentlemen know that uh, my opponent, uh, Congressman Greg Stubbe, uh, just put a bill on the floor uh, to dismantle uh, the EPA. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about that? Um, I think it's a bad idea because, I mean, if there's no oversight when it comes to, you know, protecting our government, I mean, protecting our environment and more importantly, ensuring the safety uh, of all things environmental, then who's going to be held accountable if things go wrong, um, you know, with whatever pandemics await us for the remainder of this century. So, you know, I, th I think maybe... I would assume that your opponent is saying that the government should be smaller and that's his reasoning for uh, eliminating the EPA. I think it should be more about not getting rid of things that may not work the best way. It's more, how can we reform it to make it more effective and to make it work smarter um, while still allowing a lot of regional sovereignty with you know, what we grow, how we grow it, and um, you know, how our industries thrive. So I disagree with the the, unilateral dismantling of the EPA. I don't know if Kyle feels the same way, but that's how I feel. What do yeah. you think, Trevor? I, I don't oh, sorry, agree. Trevor. It's okay. I don't agree with it going away uh, completely. Um, with anything, there's always uh, room for improvement um, on programs. Um, I don't believe that they should get um, larger, um, but at the same time, you know, there's there, there needs to be rules and regulations in place um, because that's what sets us apart um, from other countries. Yeah. You know, I, I believe this. I believe that, you know, every year our population uh, nationally grows. Uh, we're already at 350 plus million people. And as the society grows, there, the demand for um, a safe environment increases. The demand for uh, food increases, clean water, it increases. Uh, but also the likelihood of our air quality decreases. And so with that being the case, uh, it only makes sense to have a stronger EPA to cover what's growing. And, and it goes to, it goes to the, the idea of, you know, it's really not about how big or how small government is. It's really a matter of, does it work? And oftentimes our government isn't working the way that it should. Uh, we have to always keep up with a, a rising population. Uh, and that would be the same thing for our economic system, our capital system, our, our um, healthcare system, our immigration system. You know, this world isn't getting smaller, it's getting larger. And uh, we have to do all that we can do. And that's my take. Um, Another question that came from Jim out of Charlotte County, and that was, you know, has uh, the um, the trade 
uh, relationships with China, has that had any impact on uh, your business or anyone that you know? Well, um, I'll reference back again with um, we were kind of used as a, a pawn, I guess, in, in the bigger negotiations on things, you know, because big industry, you know, in, in agriculture is always going to be your row crop farming, um, you know, your Midwest, and that's what takes uh, precedence in a lot of the uh, trade uh, discussions. Uh, so we, you know, as a industry in, in Florida and citrus, you know, we're um, offered up, I guess, so to say, um, and we've, you know, written, uh, letters to, uh, uh, Secretary Purdue, um, you know, and others up in, in DC voicing our displeasure, asking, um, you know, for all the, uh, the checks and, and, uh, phytosanitary, um, checkpoints that they've got in place, um, you know, to make sure that we don't have another, um, disease that comes in. Um, so that's definitely, uh, impacted, you know, us, I wouldn't say on a, um, on a monetary um, side, but more so on concern on uh, future disease and, and pest pressure at some point. Yeah. So uh, for those of you who are just joining, we are having a town hall discussion on agriculture. Uh, and our guest is Trevor Murphy and Anthony Eichberger. Uh, and we're having this discussion to raise the issues uh, on agriculture throughout the District of 17, Florida and the, and the nation. So if you can, please click like and share uh, this town hall so that others can join in. And we have a question from Mary uh, out of uh, Charlotte County as well. And she wants to know, uh, Trevor, have you seen any uh, workers getting COVID-19 at your business? And, or do you know of any other farmers that may have uh, had the same thing happen to them? Not in my business, nor anybody that... Uh that we do business with, um, which we run from Osceola County all the way down to, uh, to Mockley. So um, employees as well as uh, farm workers, um, I'm not aware of any, any cases on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, here, we have uh, another question that came from Terry out of Hillsborough County. Thank you, Terry, for joining us out of Hillsborough. Uh, Hillsborough was in our district in 2016, but we lost them. And um, what he wanted to know was, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have about sustainable agriculture? Uh, Richard? Oh, sorry. Uh, Anthony, can you answer? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, definitely what I pointed out earlier about the, uh, the red herring that it's gonna be a government takeover of agriculture. N nothing that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, again, it's a matter of, I think, reframing it in what policies are going to allow free market competition to be uh, optimized. And I think agricultural diversity is, to me, it's the obvious answer, but it doesn't get enough discussion from pundits and from uh, you know, the, uh, the political community as a whole. Um, and also I think the, uh, the jobs, people say, well, is it gonna create enough jobs if you have uh, more sustainable agricultural um, policies because it's gonna require more investment. And I would say, you know, it's just like with renewable energy, you know, it's hard to point to specific evidence when we're trying to get people to do things in a different way, to try out new things, new investments. And, um, you know, we won't have those numbers until we put more research and investing into it. So, uh, you know, if anyone's asking us for a, a crystal ball as to, to prove that, you know, agri sustainability is the path forward. I mean, I think common sense is, is, is really painting that picture. Uh, and I think the final thing that I think is a big misconception is people who say we're not in a crisis right now. Maybe we're not smack in the middle of a food crisis, but I would argue we could very well be on the verge of one, you know, because try telling, try telling people that the status quo is fine when they're, undergoing farm bankruptcies, uh, when you know, they, they can't continue to uh, sell their product because of all the, um, as it was said earlier, the restaurants that are closed and all of the uh, uncertain food chains. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. So I think for that reason, um, 
you know, more crop diversity just makes more sense, especially from different sources. And um, I think that's ultimately what's going to keep prices down, but also um, expand markets so that um, farmers can sell to more places, including exports. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Trevor, are you hiring right now? Well, uh, our 60 employees just uh, went, went back home. Um, but in the future, you know, we, we've got to pay our domestics um, on the harvesters um, the same as what we do in, uh, with H-2As, um, which is the prevailing wage of the area, which is a minimum of $11.40 an hour. Um, so it's, it's over the, uh, the minimum wage in, in the area. Um, and it's, it's hard work, um, but we're, we're always welcome, uh, welcoming new people to, to give it a shot. Thank you very much. Anthony, can you tell the viewers a little bit more about your, um, your program? Uh, because we have viewers coming in uh, a little late. So could you please tell yeah. them? Well, yeah, um, I mean, Regis is a public awareness campaign. The acronym Regis stands for Raising, Eating, Growing, Inventing, Sustaining. Um, I don't, you know, right now we don't have a website yet, but hopefully before the year's over, that's the goal. Um, Right now, the, the primary goal is to just divert attention toward candidates who support sustainable agriculture and you know, to get that discussion to become way more prominent than it has been in past election cycles. So you know, by using the AgriWarrior hashtag and by um, you know, talking about the importance of our food systems when it comes to climate change, when it comes to job creation and other issues that we've touched upon today, um, I think linking those things, uh, that's really, again, like I said earlier, the millennials and the centennials are going to be the driving force behind it, um, ultimately. And I think that's where you can get that excitement, generate that excitement, especially when it comes to down ticket candidates. <laughs> what do you have a Facebook page? Uh, yeah, actually, um, I don't know if you can see this here. This is my if you put this hashtag into Facebook um, or my name, too, because my name's displayed on there. But you can use this handle. This is also my Twitter handle as well. So you can follow my account on Twitter uh, using that. So that's those are the best ways to reach me um, as of right now online. But uh, like I said, hopefully the website is forthcoming and we'll have more, uh, a more um, multifaceted resource for people to access online in the, in the future. Well, you do have the, uh, the newsletter. Yes, and we have the newsletter too. So, um, you know, we have a mailing list. We send out both sna snail mail and electronic copies, depending on anyone's preference. So uh, contact me and I can definitely put you on our newsletter mailing list if you, you put out three issues a year and that may increase next year, depending on what happens. So. Well, maybe you can get some content from Trevor there. Yeah, yeah. And tr Trevor, I'm glad I finally learned your name. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, uh, can you, can you, Tell people about your businesses and what website they can go to and, and how they can learn more about what you're doing. Because I, I find what you're doing, you're doing is uh, fascinating and I want to get involved myself. So I'm sure there's others out there that may be interested as well. You're on, hold on for a second. There you go. Um, but my uh, social media presence is uh, kind of weak. Um, we, we do have a uh, Instagram, uh, which is Con Citrus, Con with a K, K-A-H-N, Citrus. Um, it's been a while since I've updated, but there's some uh, pretty good pictures on there. We also have a uh, website, uh, which is congroves.com. Um, you can check out. We've uh, got my contact information on there. Um, if you have any questions, uh, um, I love to, to talk about the industry. It's a uh, it's not only work, but it's a, a passion of mine. Um, so, well, thank you, gentlemen, both for joining us this evening. Uh, we have uh, been here a little over an hour now. Uh, we've talked about a lot, uh, especially when it comes to uh, citrus greening. I hope uh, people that were listening were able to learn something uh, about what citrus greening is. Um, my name is Alan Ellison. I'm running for the United States House of Representatives to represent Florida's 17th district. This town hall was on agriculture. I am a strong uh, person when it comes to uh, agriculture. I believe that our farmers and our uh, migrant workers 
uh, should have all of the resources made available to them so that they can continue to do uh, what they do to put food on our tables. And so uh, please, if you wanna know more about my stance on agriculture or the environment, you can visit my website at ellisonforcongress.com. Also be sure to join our Facebook page at Allen Ellison for Congress. And again, thank you all for taking the time out to join us on this town hall uh, and stay safe. Uh, we know that today uh, we have lost over 100,000 uh, people due to COVID-19. Uh, we wanna make sure that we can uh, reduce that number. So please wash your hands for more than 20 seconds, put soap and water, uh, be sure to wear your mask at every chance you get. And if you have little kids, be sure to buy them some goggles. You can get some really inexpensive goggles from like the dollar store uh, and that will protect their eyes from uh, COVID-19 entering their eyes, nose or mouth. Uh, uh, so do that, uh, stay safe, continue to practice social distancing. And if you can uh, hire somebody to do some work from home, uh, if you're an employer, uh, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through it together. We're gonna be smart about it. And our prayers and thoughts are with you. And we and our hearts go out to all of the families that have lost loved ones. Uh, you all continue to have a, a wonderful evening and check us back here again next Tuesday. Uh, I will have a town hall, which will be Dean uh, Getting Social with Alan uh, this Thursday. Uh, and it's gonna be in the, in the daytime. We'll put out some information on Facebook, but uh, we're gonna go into my background and who I am and uh, what makes me tick. <laughs> so uh, thank you gentlemen for coming on and you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Alan.